Welcome to Choose the Nickel. I'm your host, George Bailey. My co-founder and technical support is the gorgeous Christina Bailey. This podcast is about giving kids financial freedom. We're interviewing fascinating people for their insights about how children learn to be financially savvy. Our guests come from diverse, sometimes conflicting schools of thought, and we love the opportunity to learn from them. We encourage all to weigh our guests' ideas on how to help children thrive, both financially and in general. We invite you to visit our website at www.choosethenickel.com, subscribe to our newsletter, and try out the things we are learning on the podcast. Our next guest is Daniel Crosby. Daniel is an expert in behavioral finance and a thought leader on market psychology. He's the founder and president of Nocturne Capital and has been named one of Investment News 40 Under 40. His book, Personal Benchmark, which was co-authored with Charles Widger of Brinker Capital, is a New York Times bestseller. Daniel has his own blog and podcast, and the AARP says he's a financial blogger you should be reading. Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Crosby. Daniel Crosby, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Daniel, you have led an interesting career, and uh, in some of our previous conversation, you mentioned that you kind of have specialized in some offbeat practices or accomplishments from what you know you, what you normally do. Can you tell me a little bit about the things that you are the most proud of that you have accomplished professionally? Well, I think what I'm what I'm known for is being an expert in a field called behavioral finance, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about a great deal today. But some of my proudest accomplishments are actually outside of that. You know, I was awarded uh, a, an award by the family of Viktor Frankl for some work I did on uh, multiculturalism in the application of Dr. Frankl's work. So he is an absolute hero of mine. Um, I think his book, Man's Search for Meaning, about his uh, living through the Holocaust and finding meaning and purpose in the midst of, of that tragedy is probably the most important book ever written. And so to get, a, get an award from his family was just absolutely one of the greatest days of my life. Um, I've also written a children's book. Uh, the name of the book is Everyone You Love Will Die. And so it's, it's, uh, that, actually... that's chipper stuff, man. That's chipper. <laughs> so I'm not, <laughs> listen, listen, nobody becomes a psychologist because they're well adjusted. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. I wrote this, um, I wrote this actually, uh, to talk to my kids about death. I have three young children, um, and I wrote this poem about uh, death and how it, it is, believe it or not, actually a heartwarming story in the end. Uh, it says, everyone you love will die, but you're here today, and so am I. And it's, it's just about spending uh, the most time and getting the most out of every moment. And so uh, I wrote this poem. I put it on Facebook. A friend of mine was touched by it and uh, mocked up some great illustrations for it. And so at that point, I said, well, heck, we've, you know, we've got a book at this point. So we submitted it to Kickstarter. Kickstarter made it their editor's pick. It got funded in like 12 hours. And now it just got picked up for, for major publication. So yeah, I'm sort of known for my work in the financial world, but I've had this uh, quirky little career with many, many acts and uh, all of them have been satisfying in their own way. On top of that book, you've got another book called You're Not That Great. Again, a very similar theme. You know, everybody's get around you is going to die. You're not that great. Uh, but I, I like this one. This one attracted me because it really picks on that kind of self-help culture that is, you know, you're good enough and you're going to do great in life just because you are who you are. You counter that with a little bit of sobering thought about how we really need to build to excellence. Uh, where do you get the ideas for these books? Um, just deep in my sad, sad brain, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So, um. <laughs> I, I've just, uh, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Alabama and it's just, you know, there's, there's a real sort of dark Gothic thread that runs through the deep South. And I think just growing up, I was, I was attracted to, to realness, uh, to authenticity, to, to straight talk. And I've tried to bring that authenticity and that, that straight talk to my professional career. Um, and that was originally a TED talk that I did that was that was very successful and well received. And so I, I wanted to take that and, you know, put it put it on paper. So that's a, a great little book and a quick read. Very cool. Well, 
this brings me back to your childhood. Because if you're having this desire for the authentic and the real, do you have specific experiences in your childhood that prompted that or at least made you aware that this was something that really drove you? Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I um, I was born on the day that my grandfather died. My maternal grandfather died on the, the day that I was born, and I'm named after him. I look just like him. Uh, we both have an affinity for Russian literature and uh, entrepreneurship. So all my life, I've sort of grown up in his shadow and just grown up being compared to him. And he died when he was 42 years old. So the, these comparisons sort of let me know from a very early age that, you know, not everyone gets the 80 or 90 years that they think that they're uh, entitled to and that you need to have a sense of urgency around making your mark on the world. And so, uh, you know, I wake up every morning with my hair on fire somewhat thinking that I need to put a little something good into the universe each day. And I, I've tried to do that uh, throughout my career. That is, that's great. Uh, you know, it makes me think, I, I joke about this a little bit, and, and I, I, I want to focus on you more than myself, but I grew up George Bailey, and that does something to you. <laughs> <laughs> so at least on that level, I can totally relate. Now, what I don't get, though, is the Russian literature bit, you know, because everything else, I'm like, you know, I can see that some of this is in your DNA, but that's a really fascinating parallel. Where did that come from? Uh, it was the Cold War. I mean, I think, I think uh, <laughs> another know, for, dark and depressing era of yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, he was, you know, he was a professional in the in the Cold War era and was, you know, very much part of that sort of duck and cover uh, growing up. And so it's fascinating when he found out that he had terminal cancer. Um, he actually spent a number of months in Russia, which is not not easy to do uh, at the time. Uh, but got permission to spend a couple of months in Russia because it was literally on his bucket list to spend some time there. He was getting a, a master's degree in Russian literature. He was an engineer by profession, but was getting a master's degree in Russian literature when he died and left quite an extensive library of Russian literature to the local university, which, you you know, you can't say about every kid from a farm in South Alabama. So he was a, he was quite a guy. That's terrific. Now, you have, on the one hand, this kind of quirky dark side, but you do have a draw towards the financial. Where did that come from? Is that something that you think developed in your childhood, or is that something that developed later on? Well, uh, a little of both, actually. So I'm the son of a financial advisor. So in, in a very real respect, I grew up steeped in that world. Uh, and I like to joke, but it's, it is not a joke at all that uh, I grew up in a religious household and my, uh, you know, we were not to swear and not to say bad words. And one of the bad words that we grew up knowing was a four letter word was debt. And we were actually, I kid you not, not allowed to say the word debt. It was a D word, just like, you know, it was a D, a <laughs> Any D other word, one. <laughs> just like the other D word. And so, um, yeah, my dad was a freak about paying off our house, you know, paid off our house. I think in his early 30s. And I mean, we just grew up eating beans and rice with the understanding that, you know, the surplus was going to pay off the house. And that's why that's why you couldn't order drinks at dinner kind of thing. So grew up steeped in that, but then sort of lost it and then rediscovered it, I think, as an adult, because as a kid, I think, you know, money just kind of grows on trees and you don't really think about it too much. I mean, especially if you grow up in a house where there there is some money. Uh, but then again, when I when I was an adult, I began to rediscover these things and fall in love with them when I learned how much human behavior was part of the money conversation. I had sort of a two dimensional understanding of money, I think, early on and thought it was just ticking and tying and dollars and cents and math. And when I began to discover sort of the human element of, of personal finance and investment management is when I got interested again. Go back to that time when you were interested in money or you, you understood you, you guys were tight and then things kind of loosened up. What did that look like? What were some of the events that you know precipitated this kind of loosening up? Like, okay, we can not worry so much about it. Well, so my dad got his job, which is, you know, the job he still has, he's still an investment advisor, but he got the job on the, on the day that I was born. It was a very eventful day. Wow. Let me say. 
Yeah, yeah, a lot happened that day. So he's, you know, he's been in the business for now, what now, nearly 39 years. And he was cutting lawns. I mean, he was cutting lawns previous to that. He had dropped out of, he had dropped out of an MBA program. I think my grandmother and others were worried about him finding his place in the world. So he was cutting lawns. My mother worked at McDonald's when she was um, pregnant with me. And so they, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. And even as a child, those of you who, who know about sort of the career trajectory of a financial advisor, first of all, the burnout is uh, horrendous. I mean, it's like 80, 85 percent of people don't make it past the first couple of years. Uh, but if you do, the first couple of years are very lean. So, you know, growing up as a kid, we were, you know, it was tight for the first for, for my early childhood. Uh, but then if you stick with that profession, you tend to do very well over time. So, you know, I have a sibling who's nearly 12 years younger than me. And I mean, we grew up in absolutely different households from a financial perspective, totally night and day in terms of how much money my family had when I was a kid versus when he came around. That's amazing. And do you remember kind of the way that you started thinking differently about money? Uh, Do you feel like there was a little bit of a swing of the pendulum? Yeah, yeah, there was. But it's funny, because if you look at my brother, the, you know, my brother, who's quite a bit younger than me, if you look at my brother, and I, I think a lot of those early lessons persist. So in high school, I was aware that my family now had money, like that, that we were yeah. okay. And that, you know, mom and dad were going to be all right. But you still maintain that sort of frugality, at least in my case, that I learned early on, Whereas I think my brother, say, uh, who grew up with a, a great deal more affluence, you know, he, that's that's what he's used to. And I think that we've carried those those lessons with us into adulthood and we, you know, make different decisions as a result. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I think about some of the lessons that I learned about frugality as a kid. I grew up, you know, in a more of a struggling household and I don't like spending money. <laughs> you know, it's it's not it's not something that I, I look at as fun. You know, I wish that were different sometimes, but you know, whatever. Now, in terms of hobbies, what was what were the types of things that you guys like to do as a family? So we didn't do much. I mean, you know, I think that that's one of my parents' great regrets and something that they've tried to tell me to do. I mean, we had a great family. We like to you know go to the park and go on walks and ride our bikes and do you know, regular suburban kid stuff. But my family did not go on trips. We didn't travel. We didn't do much because money was tight when I was a kid. And they have said to me in my adult life that they wish that they had prioritized that a bit more because now they do have money, but, you know, they don't have their kids at home. Their health is not as good as it as it was. And so they've tried to encourage me to temper my natural bent to want to save a a lot of what I earn with sort of this understanding that you never get that time back and you have to stretch a little bit and make memories with people. And in fact, the the psychological literature on, on money says that the two best ways that you can spend money is on time with people you love, experiences with people you love, and on giving it away, on being charitable. So... Oh, that's awesome. Uh, do you feel like you are taking that to heart? Give me some examples of ways that you think that advice now has influenced you. So that advice really, really has stuck with me. My mom has some serious health problems and they're not able to travel in the way that they'd like. And even though they have, you know, they're, they're comfortable now. And so I have really taken that to heart and have really tried to take my wife and my three children on a lot of my business trips and then on a lot of other trips as well because I travel a lot for work. And so I'm always looking for ways to bring one of the kids along, to bring my wife along. And I just, I want to show the the kids the world. I think it's a great way for them to get outside of their own bubble to reduce bias and prejudice and this sort of two-dimensional understanding of the way the world works. So to me, travel is is a must there's other lessons of my father's and of the, the psychological literatures that I've ignored. And I've ignored at my own peril. A couple of years ago, I bought a big house. All of the research says fancy cars, big houses are not sort of the key to happiness uh, in, with respect to your wealth, because we are so easily habituated to them. 
the first time I walked through the doors of my now home, I was blown away. And now I walk through the doors of my home and it's just, you know, where I throw my dirty socks, right? So you, you really, you really quickly, wherever you live, just comes your reality. So that's one, that's one lesson that I ignored and I, and I regret having ignored it. That's powerful stuff. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your frankness on that because I do think about that. We have a, a more modest home right now and, and, you know, we have a galley kitchen, which for me is something that that's just got to go. You know, <laughs> when we buy our last home, that will probably be the one feature that we will look heavily at. You know, I know that I've already habituated to this home when we've lived in much smaller even, you know, just now me and my family right now. I want to go back to this book, You're Not That Great, because that message, it's obvious here that the audience that you've catered it to is adults. But how do we teach our kids this? If you have any thoughts on that, or if you gave that any thought while you were writing this book and while you were giving that TED Talk... Because we live in a culture today that says, you know, you've got to tell your kids how great they are. You've, they've got to be special. Where's the balance in that? So I think the good lesson there is, is a lesson that's also good for investors, which is you emphasize a process over outcomes. So in investment management, you can get the right outcome. That is your, your, you know, your holdings can go up. Uh, even if you take the wrong process. Okay. So if you had hmm. put all of your money, if you had taken your entire 401k and invested it in Canadian marijuana stocks, you know, you'd be up quite a bit in the last, uh, you know, the last week or two. Well, it's still a dumb idea. Like even if, even if the outcome is correct, the process is flawed. And so it's not the right thing to do because over the long term, you know, probability being what it is that tends to not be a, a good choice. So yeah. I try and emphasize the same thing with, with my, with my kids is we're going to emphasize honesty, diligence, hard work, not whether or not you, you know, win the spelling bee or whatever. So my, my daughter, my oldest daughter is nine years old uh, and she ran for student council yesterday and they'll find out today whether or not she won. And th throughout that process, which is, by the way, killing me, and I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so you feel like you're the one running for the office. Yeah, <laughs> that's fun. Like, please. I was helping her with her speech, and she's just so proud. And I'm like, oh, please vote for my baby. But, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Win or, you know, win, what, what my wife and I have tried to do is, that, you know, win or lose, you're doing an important thing. You know, you're, you're civically involved. You're going through this process. You're doing it the right way. You want to improve, you know, things in your classroom. And so whether you win or lose, that's not what, you know, she's not going to get a huge rah rah from us if she wins or, you know, huge disappointment if she loses. We're proud that she tried. There's a study that I talk about in the book that was done by Carol Dweck and she was working in the New York City public school system with these kids. And in group A, she complimented them for being brilliant little special snowflakes. And in group B, she complimented them for working hard, keeping their head down and following the rules. Then she has them uh, write a letter to a pen pal in Texas, which, of course, you know, there is no pen pal. But uh, she says, hey, tell them a little bit about yourself and then transcribe your report card. You know, put put a copy of your grades there. And so the kids that were in the special snowflake group, nearly half of them lied about their grades. But the kids who were in the hard work group, every single one of them told the truth. So that, that I think is, is the key is to emphasize diligence, hard work and process over outcomes. And, and if you apply a diligent process over time, you're going to, you're going to win more than you lose in, in life and in financial markets. When the outcomes with your child turn out, pretty spectacular. What do you do then? I mean, like, is there room for praise for the outcome? What are your thoughts? Yeah, 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 absolutely. But I think you praise, you, you praise the right things. You know, if, if my daughter's lucky enough to win her little race today, uh, I will praise her for effort. And I will ask her about sportsmanship. You know, she's running against some of her, you know, really good friends. And I'll ask her, how did you handle talking to your good friends about about winning you know were you kind were you gentle did you congratulate them on having 
put forth their best effort. So, yeah, I mean, look, I'm I'm as proud as the next parent and perhaps more so. But I think you want to praise the right things. And part of that is praising effort and, and praising ethics and not just praising winning at any cost. Yeah. No, and it, and it makes a lot of sense. I I like the theory. I like the philosophy behind it. I've heard similar things and I'm trying to do the same things with my own kids. And sometimes it's really hard because sometimes I see their little self-esteems take quite a beating out there in the cold, cold world. You want to jump on that and, and give them kind of the encouragement. This is something that you can do. Now, going back to these vacations that you've been doing with your kids, practically speaking, how have you been balancing that with their educational needs? I mean, you know, are you taking them out of school to do stuff like that? And how are you keeping them on top of their life outside of the vacation? Well, first of all, our kids attend public schools. My wife and I both attended public schools and felt like we got a good education. You know, I've had a, I've had a pretty good run as a product of Alabama public schools. So if you can do it there, you can do it, you can do it, to, you can do it in Alabama public schools. You can do it anywhere. So my t- kids attend public school. So yeah, I mean, there's limitations around that, but like, you know, this Thanksgiving, we're going to take them to Europe. So. We'll take them out of school for part of it, but part of it will be around the vacation. Last Thanksgiving, we took them to Ireland. They've had a great time. So that's part of it. I think that's the most educational thing you can do. I mean, is it is it better for my daughter to be walking the halls of the Louvre or or doing worksheets in her class? Like I try, I think, (laughs) you know, I think that the best parents make everything a learning opportunity. I mean, you can teach your kids a lesson at dinner. You can teach your kids a lesson on a walk. You can certainly teach your kids a lesson in a museum. We try and make everything uh, a learning opportunity. And and this is no exception. But yeah, you've got to work around the practical parameters or the state of Georgia comes knocking on your door after, after, after too many absences. I hear that too from other parents that it's great to be able to take the time to really talk with your kids. Do you ever feel like you're slipping into dad lecture mode? No doubt. Being a doctor of psychology makes you more, (laughs) you know, more prone than most to pontificating. There's a lot of meta parenting going on right now. (laughs) Sure. Sure. But I try and strike that balance. You know, I think on the one hand, you've got the very authoritarian parenting style, which I don't know that that does anyone any favors. And then on the other extreme, you've got these sort of, I want to be your best friend parents. And I love my kids. I want to be their friend, but they also need structure and rigor and they also need to know who's boss. (laughs) So I try and strike a balance between teaching, educating and loving. And I had great parents. And so it's been pretty natural for me to just follow. My parents left me with good instincts, I think, in that respect. Yeah, no, that's great. If you could tell me what were the most positive experiences you remember with your parents that helped prepare you for adulthood? Things that really just made you understand how much you meant to them. So I, I think there's no substitute for time. You know, when, when you ask my mom's uh, 60th birthday is in a couple of weeks. And so my wife is compiling a sort of like a, this is your life type book of letters from all of the people that, that love her. And it's been interesting to look at that and see that everyone's best experiences with my mom and perhaps with everyone are all around time. It's not money. You know, the memories I have of her are playing baseball at the park and her pitching to me when I was, you know, learning to hit, even though she didn't love baseball, perhaps the way that I did. And my wife and I actually listened to a podcast yesterday where they meta analyzed obituaries. So they went back and looked at obituaries. And they teased out the most common words, right? So when someone is being remembered, what are they remembered for? And the most frequently occurring word was help. And I thought that that was a fascinating commentary because we're most remembered when we're giving our time and we're giving our assistance. Uh, And so that that to me uh, rings true with with my parents. And and they were both wonderful about giving me a, a great deal of help and a great deal of their time. No wonder that as you go back to that study that you referred to about how we use our money that helps us to feel the happiest, that one of those two ways is the way in which we give that money. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I think that there's definitely a real connection there. Now, you're really into behavioral finance. Can you give us a, a short definition of what that is? Yeah. So behavioral finance is just finance that accounts for the messiness and irrationality of human beings. So, you know, a lot of economic models are mathematically elegant, um, but predictively useless because they don't account for humans doing silly stuff with their money, right? Behavioral finance just tries to introduce the human element into our models of human behavior. That's great. Is this something that can be taught to a kid on any level? Because, you know, obviously it can be taught in in college, which is probably where you picked up, you know, the, the bulk of your understanding about it. At what level do you think you need to be before you can really understand the significance of behavioral finance? There's easy lessons about behavioral finance that I teach my kids all the time. One of the things that I try and teach my kids is how to be an informed consumer of media and how, you know, things, the way that we're marketed to and the way that brands and and folks will tell a story impacts your purchasing decisions. So, I mean, I'll be, I'll be in whatever target with them and say, okay, look, kids, like they say this is a $25 value and it's now marked down to $12. Like, why? Why do you think uh, why do you think they've done this, you know? Do you think it's really a $25 value or <laughs> or or is it worth what the market will bear, right? So you, you you know, you teach them about those little psychological tricks and you know, going again back to my daughter and her little runoff thing today, I talked to her about one of the the most important findings of prospect theory, which is this Nobel Prize winning, you know, lofty theory in behavioral finance. But it shows that people are two and a half times as upset about a loss as they are excited about a comparably sized gain, mm. you know, to, to put to put it in her terms. Yeah, you you might be really upset if you lose. You're not going to be all that happy if you win. But you can't let that from keeping you from living life. You know, I think some people because of this aversion to loss and this aversion to risk, I think some people never try. You know, I was talking to her effectively about prospect theory, but in simpler terms under the guise of, you know, look, you got to get out there and try. And yeah, this is going to hurt. Like if, if it doesn't go your way, it's, it's going to suck and it's going to hurt, but that's life. One of the things that I love about behavioral finance is it's commonsensical in some ways and that it's applied, it's applied. And so you can take these things and, and work them into the way that you, you teach your kids. So one of the reasons why I reached out to you and wanted to interview you on this podcast was because I listened to your own podcast. You talked about prospect theory on the, on the, on that podcast. I was actually listening and your explanations were very clear. It's not, there are not a lot of people out there to, who just have that type of a gift to be able to explain complex theories and ideas and concepts with real clarity. Is that something that you think we can develop as parents, the ability to be able to explain these complex things to our kids? How do we get to that point where we really feel confident breaking these things down with clarity to kids? The answer to this, the answer to everything in psychology is that it's biopsychosocial, right? So part of it's innate. <laughs> yeah, and that's a, quite a cop out, but I'll, 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 move, I'll move on from the cop out. So yeah, some of it's innate, some of it's not. But there's a, a scientist that I love named Richard Feynman, and he talks about there's something called the Feynman technique that says basically you learn about something, you try and teach it. And in that effort, you'll discover deficits in your own learning. So then you go plug those holes, you go back and teach it again. And he has this great example of how does a toilet work, right? So if you ask, if you ask, if you ask, you know, the average person, hey, hey, do you know how a toilet works? Like everyone goes, well, yeah, like, you, you know, you flush it and it goes away. But if you say, (laughs) okay, like, tell me, tell me about the mechanics of a toilet. And I mean, none of us have any idea. And this is true of whatever microwaves, TVs, you know, every, everything you use on a daily basis. And so for me, the reason I write and the reason I speak is, is as part of this iterative process of discovering what I believe, 
I mean, I write this, I shouldn't tell people this because then they're not going to buy my books, but you know, I write, <laughs> <laughs> I write to try and figure out if I really believe the things that I'm writing about in some respect. And so I, teaching and simplifying is where you figure out how much you know. And until you can teach it to a kid, you don't get it. That is, is such a great point. And I totally agree. I, you know, I, I actually write as a method of self discovery myself. I do that as well. And I bet you that pretty much all writers understand that, though few would kind of acknowledge it. And I think that that's actually one of the reasons why it's important to take the opportunity to teach to begin with so that you can explore those deficits. I love teaching. I'm totally with you on that entirely. Thank you for giving it a psychological name that I'd never heard of it before. Say that one more time. Oh, so it was the Feynman technique. So F-E-Y-N-M-A-N technique. Okay, I'll I'll put that in the show notes for sure and do a little bit of reading up on that later. I really appreciate that. Do you have any advice for parents who are trying to raise financially, professionally wise children? Yeah, I guess my, my piece of advice would be you're sending messages all the time with your own behavior that have nothing to do with your words. I mean, kids pick up on what you do and not what you say. I think a lot of parents talk a good game about money, but they do a lot of things wrong. I think, first of all, that they, that they prioritize work over family and kids pick up on that message. And I think the other thing is, We talk a good game sometimes about frugality and thrift and savings. But, you know, the average American is what? Like half of us can't cover a $500 emergency. 50% of Americans uh, who have access to workplace retirement plans don't take advantage of them. I mean, most of us, many of us are sending our kids these tacit messages all the time about how to behave with money. And they're, they're picking them up. Let your actions speak louder than your words, I guess, would be a simple but not easy piece of advice with respect to all this. And that goes back to your point about how, you know, when we, the the power of praising the action as opposed to kind of, you know, who you are, some innate character or something like that. I think that that goes back to ourselves. We need to make sure I'm not just going to give myself credit for, you know, I have this and this belief. I have to really kind of look at my own actions, my goals that I'm setting for myself, you know, the habits that I've established on a weekly basis. How can I conform those to the ideals that I hold so dear or at least say that I espouse? Having done so much with money and really, I think, set a pretty positive standard for yourself and helped a lot of people with finance, what is your favorite, favorite charitable cause? Oh, oh, my goodness. Uh, So my wife and I talk a lot about this and we approach giving uh, the way that we approach investing, which is we want to have a diversified portfolio. I read some books as we've begun to be more comfortable and had a greater opportunity to give. We've read some books on how to do this. and, And some of these books will say every dollar you give should go to mosquito nets because, you know, mosquito nets are saving, you know, for for two bucks, you can save a life. And that's, you know, that's compelling stuff. But, you know, my wife is an artist. She's a pianist. She's a visual artist. And we also want to give some money to to the visual arts in, in our community. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is diversify that. And so a portion of what we give goes to the arts, a portion goes to education, and a portion goes to sort of life saving, you know, high impact life saving measures like the mosquito nets. But I would say my favorite, my favorite cause of all will be a shout out to my hometown. There's an organization in there called the Mana House that feeds about 700 people a, a day. And the woman who runs that just feels called to feed people. And so people start lining up at two, two or three in the afternoon for a, for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And so, you know, watching the Mana House do the incredible work that they've done over the years has been a real inspiration to me. That's my absolute favorite. But bigger picture, I try and try and diversify that giving uh, the same way that I try and diversify my investing. I was just at uh, YouthBridge. It's a an organization in St. Louis that tries to steer money from the wealthy who are, are wishing to give towards charitable causes that will most effectively fulfill their wishes. 
Mm-hmm. You know, because sometimes it's like, well, I know I want to give to this cause, but I don't know where it's going to, you know, make the the biggest bang. So they help steer them in that direction. They've ha- they've got a similar philosophy that I really enjoy, and that is that if you look at your charitable giving as if it were an investment, then yes, you want to see a return. You want to see accountability. You want to see change and not just feel like your money's going into the hands of people who are kind of spending it 80% on administrative costs and 20% on your cause. So I, I like that. Going back to this mana, what is it called again? Mana? Mana house. Mana house. That's a very specific cause, hunger. What is it about hunger? that hits you in that that visceral way? Why is that so important to you? Gandhi has this great quote that says, to a poor man, bread is God. Until we can cover that bottom rung of Maslow's hierarchy, until our bellies are full, until we have adequate safety and shelter covered, we can't do any of the things that makes life worth living. Like we can't worry about love or God or the meaning of life or, or education or anything else. So to me, the thing that's so powerful about the work that Fran and the others do there is that they're covering that bottom most wrong and that allows people to be fully what they are. You can't be fully who you are. You can't begin to reach your human potential until you have that covered. So I think it's a great place to start, but there's, you know, there's a million great places to start too. No, but that's a very great specific one to, you know, to hit and to talk about. And I really appreciate you bringing it up. We'll be sure to share their, share Mana House's information in the show notes as well. Daniel Crosby, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. You've had a lot of valuable and insightful thoughts, and I look forward to airing this episode. Yeah, my absolute pleasure. Thanks for the work you're doing. Everybody else, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the interview and found useful ideas about things you can do with your kids. Be sure to check the show notes at www.choosethedickle.com for links to names, books, and other resources we discussed in today's show. Also, please subscribe to our newsletter and visit our contact page where you can give us feedback. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube, and you can follow Choose the Nickel on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We invite you to share Choose the Nickel with your friends and join us in our quest to teach kids financial freedom.